You know, I've been giving a lot of thought to having this topic as an entire show. And so I brought with me one of the best police trainers in the country because we want to talk about police training in a post George Floyd world. Lieutenant Randy Sutton, welcome to the show. And thanks for having me, Betsy. This is this is a critical topic, especially now in the aftermath of everything we've seen. Well, that's the thing, Randy. So let's talk about that. You know, for the last two more than two years now, American law enforcement has, you know, we've we've been vilified, we've been abused, we've been told that we're too violent, we're a danger to our communities, even though this none of the statistics bear this out. And a lot of agencies have been defunded. And one of the things we're seeing now, two years later, is we're seeing a decline in the number of police officers that are staying on the job, also a decline in the numbers that we are able to bring to the profession. And we're seeing a lack of training and, and quite frankly, a lack of intestinal fortitude in uh, some to do this job. Let's talk about that. You know, we we've never we've never faced a challenge like this before in 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 history. Uh, I mean, I began my police career in the '70s. Sorry to date myself, but <laughs> um, and and in the in the ensuing years, um, you know, there have there have been ups and downs for law enforcement. You know, it's a it's a very visible. Um, I mean, we're we're the most visible part of the government, and so there's there's been ups and downs. There's been the Rodney King incident. There's been sea changes here and there, but we have never seen such a, an anti-law enforcement lobby as we have seen uh, since the uh, well, with the uh, uh, you know the Ferguson, and then things started calming down again, and then George Floyd, and that was uh, the, the the pivotal moment, if you will. Uh, where we have seen law enforcement vilified by every, almost every level of, of government, um, celebrity, sports figures, uh, you name it, uh, the, the anti-law enforcement rhetoric and the resulting changes that, have, that we have seen has damaged law enforcement. I'm not gonna say beyond repair, but it's going to be a generation. It's going to be a generation before before we start seeing some normalcy. Um, if if the American people demand it, and that's really what it's going to take. I think you're right, and and we even see police leaders who vilify their own officers. You know, refuse to support them. How important is good leadership going to be in the recovery of the profession? And in, in the recovery of the profession, Randy, is gonna be the recovery of safety in America. Exactly, and we have seen, we have seen such a, a critical, um, I, I hate to say it, but cowardly leadership um, being put into place in, in police agencies across the country. There has been, um, uh, a movement afoot of political correctness that has damaged law enforcement nationally. We've seen many, many police chiefs who've been put into those positions of leadership, critical positions of leadership, who are simply either inept, incompetent, political uh, tools for, for, the, uh, for the political environment, um, but one thing we have we have seen is a diminishing um, a diminishing respect by the officers themselves for their leadership. You know, you and I both interact with police officers across the nation. I mean, every day that's our life as we talk to cops from around the country. And I have never, never seen. Um, what I'm seeing now, and that is the, the officers feel absolutely betrayed. They feel betrayed by their political leadership. Many times they feel betrayed by their department administration and leadership. 
And this is what I hear all the time. This is, this is the comment. I'm not afraid of going out there and facing the bad guys. I'm afraid of my own bosses. And that is, that is, is not only sad, but this is why we are facing these critical um, deficiencies in law enforcement response now. And, you know, and you're so right. And, and I think one of the most frustrating things is, you know, the National Police Association does polling and we find that most Americans support law enforcement. Most Americans care about us and our mental health and our safety. And they know that they need us. There seems to be this small majority that has the loudest voice or gets the voice on you know, TV and radio and in, in the media talking about how law enforcement is the problem. And so now for two years, what have we seen? We've seen you know, diminished numbers in law enforcement and an extraordinary rise in both violent crime and property crime around the nation. And then you get this, we've had this influx of pro progressive prosecutors who even when we bring them cases, they refuse to prosecute them. And, and all of this is, is a horrible stew of bad news for the American public. Now, Randy, after Ferguson and then after George Floyd, there was a lot of talk about, oh, we can't have warrior cops. We don't want cops to be aggressive. We don't want cops to have military, uh, militarized equipment and, and quote unquote military weapons. And then last month, the American public was subjected to seeing what happened um, at uh, Robb Elementary School in Ubaldi, Texas, where we saw a, a uh, not a very good law enforcement response. And I want to talk about police training and why we need to get back to basics when it comes to officer safety and active shooter training. So let's talk about that. Well, you, you, you hit it right on the head. I mean, we have seen the diminishment of training, uh, the quality of the training, the, the subject matter. Suddenly, um, in the aftermath of, uh, of Ferguson and then George Floyd, we literally saw the, the uh, and, and police training is, is the most critical aspect of policing. If you don't train your officers properly, you don't train your officers to be warriors, and, and I'm going to use that term uh, unashamedly, because there is a time when you need to be a warrior. You don't need to be a warrior every single moment of your, of your, of your shift, but you sure as hell better be ready to go into warrior mode at the moment that it is required. And what we saw in Uvalde is, is one of those em embarrassing things I can imagine that we would have ever seen. I never would have thought that, that an active shooter uh, event such as that, such as Uvalde could take place and we would see such ineptitude, such, I hate to use the word cowardice, but I, I, I think I have to. And, and nothing shames me more than to refer to a police response as potentially a, coward, a, cowardly, a cowardly response. But there's, what we saw was an abject failure of leadership in Uvalde and it appears to be an abject uh, failure of training as well. You know, um, you know we're, now the, the, the videotape has surfaced of the of the seventy two minutes between the beginning of the event and the ending of of this this tragedy, and what we are seeing is bedlam. We're not seeing a coordinated law enforcement response. And this and and at this moment, after we've had active shooter training, time after time after time, what we saw there it looked like it, it looked like the Keystone Cops, and and you had officers that were that were that looked like they they just put the uniform on for the first time that day so if we don't if we don't take this seriously and we don't take training seriously we're going to see more uvaldis and 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 this to me here's the tragedy betsy the tragedy is this could have been prevented 
if we had taken, if leadership had taken their responsibilities seriously and created the training environment that needs to be, that needs to be uh, developed and, and then um, utilized within our profession, we wouldn't be seeing events like this. And that's, I think the most, maybe that's the most tragic part of this is, is I think this could have been prevented. Well, yeah, Randy, you and I were both active law enforcement um, when uh, the Columbine High School shooting happened. And we changed everything that we did in law enforcement about active shooter training. And, and one of the things that we did in law enforcement training is we talked about those warrior values, that warrior cop. And, and then, you know, that started to get, you know, we, the public started to talk about, you know, oh, we don't want warrior cops. And then I think what we saw in Uvalde is, is now people want warrior cops. And you said a very important thing that you not, you know, as a law enforcement officer, you don't go out there every day at the beginning of your shift and, and you've got this constant military warrior mindset. That's not how it works. Cops know, and we're trained to be able to do everything from uh, you know, respond to an active shooter to deliver a litter of puppies and everything in between. And we know how to switch back and forth. That's what makes us different from the military. But, you know, after George Floyd, you know, as you know, my husband is one of those dreaded warrior trainers and he teaches those warrior values of duty, honor, courage, loyalty, strength, selfless service, he got protested. He got written up in the media for teaching values like that. And, and then uh, a friend of all of ours, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, he also got attacked for using strong language while teaching police officers how to hunt an active shooter in his school. And that video of him in class was taken out of context. And frankly, he was lied about. And so I want to I want to straighten the record out on some of that. And I want to talk about some of the police training that's now available. And, and last year, you and I uh, and a lot of other trainers participated in the first annual National Law Enforcement Survival Summit put on by the Wounded Blue. You coordinated it. You're going to do it again this year. Talk about some of the training that you feel is going to be important at that event and other events around the country. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the the, the attempt to cancel um, uh, trainers like Dave and like Dave Grossman and uh, and others because they are uh, because they are uh, politically incorrect now in in some weird way. Um, th this is the exact opposite of the trajectory that we need to go. Um, now, I. I actually, you know, I, I'm a survivor of several gunfights and I credit my training that actually I attended when Dave was training um, uh, in, in the warrior mentality and in the warrior spirit. And I credit that training with saving my own life. So I'm, I'm very, very passionate about this, Betsy. And when I, when I created the Wounded Blue, which is the National Assistance and Support Organization for Injured and Disabled Officers, I began working with cops who have been injured in the line of duty, both physically and emotionally, and, and it, it got, it's even more personal to me now. So as, as, a, as a longtime trainer myself, um, I wanted to develop a program that might keep officers from getting injured or disabled in the line of duty, whether it is physical or emotional. So the, you know, the, the, the mission of the Wounded Blue is to improve the lives of injured and disabled officers through support, education, assistance, and legislation. Education is absolutely vital to the mission. So we created the last year, it was the first time we did it, and it was a resounding success. You were a participant in it. You saw it. You saw the value of it from firsthand the first National Law Enforcement Survival Summit, every aspect about surviving a law enforcement career. And that includes tactically, that includes the warrior mentality, that includes uh, a, a, a myriad of, of important training to prepare yourself for what's coming. And let me tell you, 
we all know the reality. You're going to be, if you're a police officer, you're going to face physical and emotional danger at, on a routine basis. Sometimes your own life or the life of others will be, will be out front and in your hands. And if we don't prepare our officers for that, if we don't prepare them mentally and physically and emotionally, then we are we are a letting them down, and b we are going to be we are going to be attending more police funerals, and and we we have to do everything in our power to protect those men and women, and that's what the Wounded Blue is all about. This survival summit should be mandated training for every cop in America. It will save lives. It will save careers. It will save marriages because it is all about surviving a career physically, tactically, mentally, emotionally, relationships, uh, leadership. Uh, it hits every topic. And we have the A team of trainers coming. Trainers like you, trainers like Dave, trainers like, like Sheriff Mark Lamb, uh, uh, Sheriff uh, Mark Lamb of Pinell County, um, Jason Schechterly, whose incredible story, and, and so many others. It's gonna be in Indiana this year, October 11th through the 14th. People can go to thewoundedblue.org, our website, sign up for it. It's, it's inexpensive training, and it is probably the most important training you'll ever have in your police career if you are a law enforcement officer or the spouse or loved one of a cop. And I want people to understand that, you know, you, you can have, a, a cop can have all the firearms and weapons and tactics and all that, but if you don't have the mindset Yes. To be able to use it, then frankly, they're worthless. And we've got to, you know, we've spent a lot of time now talking about de-escalation and proper pronouns and, and things like that. And I really believe, and I think the American public wants American law enforcement to get back to the business of protecting themselves and protecting them, protecting the public. And that's one of the things that, that this type of training is going to do, because, you know, you know, better than anybody, Randy, you study this stuff. And in fact, you've come out with a new book because you have been seeing the decline in numbers of law enforcement officers across this nation. And when there's not enough law enforcement officers, there's not enough of us to protect the public, and that's our job. Talk about the new book. Yeah, we're a nation in crisis, Betsy. We've never seen anything quite like this. The diminishment of, of the number of law enforcement officers across the nation in every major city. Um, we just saw 3,000 uh, people retire in New York City uh, or just resign. Now, that, that's, a, that's a massive number, uh, and, and, it, and that, that correlates to almost every department across the country. I was talking to a Phoenix officer just two days ago. They're down. They're down like six hundred people. They just have a. They just. They just graduated a police academy. Now within within the months that, that uh, two hundred almost three hundred have have retired or resigned, they were able to graduate five five people to replace that almost three hundred. This is a crisis, and and the American people. My book that is coming out of, in, in the next couple of months is called Rescuing 911, the fight for America's safety. Because we are in a fight and we, we have to band together. This, is, this book is a call to action, a call to action to all Americans that we have to become activists in our own right, activists for our own safety by, by uh, putting people into office and supporting those men and women of law enforcement who are literally putting it all on the line. If we don't take an active role and we don't say to the people who are pulling the purse strings and, and the, the people who are creating the anti-law enforcement environment, which is now permeating our nation, we are going to lose our nation because a, a nation that doesn't have effective policing is a nation that cannot stand. And we have seen this not only diminishment of law enforcement, we have seen what I call Trojan horse district attorneys, which is, this, is, this was the, one of the most insidious and successful um, attempts to undermine our nation's law enforcement um, environment uh, that, that, I, that I can ever imagine. I remember 
seeing the first uh, district attorney who, who literally spouted an anti-law enforcement thing get put into office with millions of dollars being put into their coffers by George Soros and his organizations. And now he was so successful doing that, there's now somewhere around 70, 75 district attorneys whose mission is to undermine the law enforcement criminal justice system. It's extraordinary. Randy, we just have a few seconds left. Where can people find out more about the Wounded Blue and the Summit and where can they pre-order the book? Wounded Blue uh, is uh, www.thewoundedblue.org and they can find out about who we are, what we do. They can support us. Please uh, donate what you can, even if it's 10 bucks a month. These men and women who are laying their lives uh, on the line are heroes, but they need they need you to be a hero as well for the people who are watching and listening to this. Um, the book, uh, right now it's available for, uh, not pre-order, but you can get on the list to be notified when it comes out at rescuing911.org, rescuing911.org. And much of the, uh, of the book uh, sales are going to support the Wounded Blue. So it's a, it's a, it's a mission that, you know, um, uh, this is a mission of love. It's a mission of, of necessity. And, and we need the people of this nation to band behind the men and women of the law enforcement profession and, uh, and stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Lieutenant Randy Sutton, thanks so much for spending time with us as always. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.